The Father's Holy Spirit became the Son of God in the Incarnation through the Virgin. There is a definite distinction between God as the Father and God who later manifested Himself in the flesh as God with us as a true man. Hence, the Father and Son relationship never actually occurred in time until after the Father became incarnate as a true man, as the Son of God. For the Scriptures teach that the Father alone is the only true God, John 17, 3, who also became incarnate as a true human child born and Son given as to His humanity, who is called the Mighty God and Everlasting Father as to His true divine identity. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So Jesus Christ, as the child born and as the son given, was fully human in every way. Hebrews 2, 17 says that the God who partook of flesh and blood was made exactly like all humans being made fully human in every way. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So Jesus Christ is called the Mighty God and Everlasting Father as to His true divine identity, but as a Son as to His true human identity. So Jesus is called the Prince of Peace as a child born and son given, but as to His true divinity, He's called the Mighty God and Everlasting Father. Although the scriptures clearly call the Son the Mighty God and Everlasting Father in Isaiah 9.6, the Trinity doctrine alleges that the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. Therefore, if the scriptures prove that the Son is the Holy Spirit of the Father, and the Holy Spirit of the Father became incarnate as a true human Son, then the entire Trinity doctrine collapses. Even the Trinity Triangle, which everyone knows about, says the, the, the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. So if the Scriptures state that the Father is the Son as to His true divine identity, and the Son is the Father, then the whole Trinity doctrine collapses. Because there can only be one true God, our Heavenly Father, who became incarnate as a true child born and son given. This explains why Isaiah 9, 6 says that the child born and son given would be called the mighty God and everlasting Father. The Holy Spirit of the Father became incarnate as the Christ child. One of theologian Jason Dooley summed up the similarities and the differences between the oneness view of God incarnate and the Trinitarian view in his online response to a Trinitarian. And I'm quoting from Jason Dooley, and I quote, The scripture never distinguishes between the deity of the Son and the deity of the Father, but all distinctions are between God as he exists omnipresent and transcendent and God as he exists as a genuine human being. The distinction is not in the Godhead, but in the humanity of Jesus Christ. Oneness believers and Trinitarians are similar in that, number one, both believe in one God. <clears throat> number two, both believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God. Number three, both confess that the Scripture makes a distinction between the Father, Son, and Spirit. Number four, both believe that the Son of God died on the cross and not the Father. Number five, both believe that Jesus was praying to the Father and not to himself. End quote from Brother Jason Dooley on his onespentecostal.com website. It has been my observation over the years that many Trinitarians are often confused about what oneness Pentecostals actually believe. Many falsely allege that we are saying that there is no ontological distinction between the Father and the Son whatsoever. 
That's not what we're saying. So they often mock us by pretending that we believe that the Father, as the Father, actually died on the cross, or that the man Christ Jesus actually prayed to himself as the Father. This is not what we teach. All knowledgeable oneness adherents believe that God became a true man in the Incarnation through the Virgin with a distinct human life in himself. He was made fully human in every way. John 5.26 says, As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son a life in himself. So the human life was distinct in himself, but the divine life is also distinct as our Heavenly Father who fills the heavens and the earth. So Jesus was made fully human in every way in order to suffer for us, to pray for us, and die for our sins. Because God as God cannot die. God as God doesn't pray to God. God as God cannot suffer in flesh. But it was the man Christ Jesus because God had ontologically became a man in the incarnation through the virgin by his own essence or substance of being, hypostasis, being reproduced, character, as an imprinted copy of the divine substance of being of the Father as a fully complete human being in Hebrews 1.3. Thus, many Trinitarians are erroneously alleging that we are denying any distinction between God as God, who is the Father, and God with us as a man, who is the Son, who was made fully human in every way. Yet this is not what we are saying as God, as God, cannot be fully human in every way without violating such passages as Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man. And Malachi 3, 6, I am Yahweh, I change not. What we are actually affirming is that the man Christ Jesus as the Son of the living God is not God with us ontologically as God, but rather God with us as a true, ontological, human son, a true man who could pray, be led by the Holy Spirit, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. For God as God, the Father, is not ontologically a man who can pray, be tempted of the devil, be led by the Spirit, nor can God as the Father ontologically suffer and die on the cross for our sins. Because God is not ontologically a man. Numbers 23, 19. Jason Dooley went on to spell out the major differences between the oneness and Trinitarian positions. And I'm quoting from oneness theologian Jason Dooley. Oneness believers and Trinitarians differ in that, number one, Trinitarians believe that the one God consists of three eternal persons, while oneness believes that the one God is one person. Number two, Trinitarians believe that the second person of the Trinity became incarnated, while oneness believes that the Father, who is one person, became incarnated as a true Son of God. Number three, Trinitarians believe that the Son is eternal, while oneness believes that the Son did not exist until the Incarnation through the Virgin, because the term refers to God as He exists as a man, as a Son, and not as He exists in His essential deity. Number four, Trinitarians see the biblical distinctions between the Father and the Son to be a distinction in both personality and flesh, while oneness believes that all distinctions are a result of the relationship of the Spirit of God to the incarnate God-man. As it pertains to Christology, then, the difference between Trinitarians and oneness believers is that they say it was the second person of the Trinity, not the Father who became a man, while we maintain that the one God, known as the Father, became a man. 
Jesus' testimony was that the Father was in him, and that those who saw him saw the Father. Jesus is the express image of the Father's person. Trinitarians have a hard time explaining these verses because they maintain that the second person became flesh. If that is the case, and the Father is not embodied, why did Jesus always say that the Father was in him and never say that the second person was in him? End quote. One is theologian Jason Dooley correctly outlined the major areas of agreement and disagreement between the oneness and the Trinitarian positions, which backs up everything I have been teaching. I challenge all who read this book to honestly examine all of the scriptural evidence with true and noble hearts to see if the oneness theological position we are sharing actually matches the Bible or not. For all true followers of Jesus Christ must be willing to examine the scriptures and be noble-minded like the Berean Jews did when they examined the scriptures to see whether the things that the apostles taught were true or not. The scriptural evidence proves that the Son is the man who had a beginning by his virgin conception and begetting while the Father's Holy Spirit is the divine identity who became incarnate as the Christ child. Luke 135 could not be clearer. The angel said to the virgin, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, what reason? Because the Holy Spirit came upon the virgin, and for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So why is the Son called the Son in the first place? Because the Holy Spirit came down from heaven over the Virgin Mary and incarnated himself. When Jesus said in John 6, 38, I came down from heaven. The only divine person we see coming down from heaven is the Holy Spirit of the only true God. Our Heavenly Father came down from heaven and for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So the Son was not called the Son as a timeless, co-equal, divine, second distinct God the Son person throughout eternity past. The Son had a beginning by his begetting. God the Father said, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. Hebrews 1.5 Matthew 1.20 states, The angel said to Joseph, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of, the Greek preposition ek means out of, literally. So we can read the text, do not be afraid to take Mary your, as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is out of the Holy Spirit. Not out of a second divine God, the Son person who came down from heaven. But the Christ child was conceived or reproduced according to Hebrews 1 3 as an imprinted copy character of the father's essence of being so who came down from heaven the Holy Spirit the father according to Hebrews 1 3 came down from heaven and reproduced an image of himself the image of the invisible father as the son of the living God so according to Trinitarians the wrong divine person came down from heaven in Matthew 1 20 to reproduce a man-child from the Holy Spirit's own essence of being, not from a second divine God the Son person. Christ Jesus claimed to have came down from heaven. I came down from heaven, John 6, 38. But the only spirit person we find coming down from heaven to become the Christ child is the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, 20 proves that the Christ child was not conceived out of an alleged God the Son person but out of the Holy Spirit of the omnipresent Heavenly Father himself. This explains why Jesus always spoke of his divinity as the Father's, rather than as an alleged co-equal distinct divine God the Son. Jesus said in John 12, 7-9, when Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it would be sufficient for us. 
Jesus kept talking about the Father, the Father, and the Son, and the Father. And then finally, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we, we want to know. Show us the Father, be sufficient for us. Jesus answered and said unto Philip, Have I been so long a time with you, and have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus never said, He that has seen me has seen the eternal divine God the Son. His divinity is the Father incarnate. That's why Jesus could say to Philip, Have I been so long a time with you, and have you not known me? When Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, he that has seen me has seen the divine essence of being of the Father incarnate as a man. And again in John 12, 44 to 45, Jesus plainly said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. It is hard to imagine a co-equal distinct true God the Son person saying, He that has seen me has seen the Father, and he who has seen me sees the one who sent me. If he was actually a co-equally distinct true God the Son person incarnate rather than God the Father incarnate as a man. For an alleged distinct true God the Son person should have said, He that has seen me has seen the eternally distinct God the Son. And he who believes in me believes in the co-equal divine Son. But instead, Jesus clearly said that to see him and to believe in him is to believe on the divine identity of the Father himself. Where then is the divine dignity and believability of the alleged second divine God the Son person and the alleged third divine God the Holy Spirit person of the Trinitarian concept of the deity? The Holy Spirit provided male chromosomes and blood type to the Christ child. He, the Son, is the brightness of His glory. The Greek text means the reflected brightness of His, speaking of the Father's glory, and the express image or reproduction or copy of His person. The context proves that Jesus is the reproduction or copy of the Father's divine person as a fully complete human person through the virgin conception and birth. So here we find the scriptural evidence proving that the Father himself supplied his miraculous divine substance of being in the incarnation to produce the Christ child by reproducing himself as an imprinted copy of his original substance of being as a fully complete human being in the Virgin. For if the Son of God was conceived as the incarnation of an alleged God the Son, how is it that the presence of the Holy Spirit's person came upon Mary to conceive the Christ child, and not the presence of an alleged God the Son person? Luke 135 plainly states that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, upon the Virgin, and for that reason the child shall be called the Son of God. Although we find numerous references to the omnipresent Holy Spirit existing throughout the Hebrew Scriptures and the Old Testament, we never find a pre-existent living Son anywhere from Genesis to Malachi. This fact alone should serve as a red flag to all those who have been duped into believing in an alleged timeless, eternally distinct, heavenly God the Son person. There's only one divine person. Our Heavenly Father, who is the only true God. You don't see Jesus praying, O Heavenly Holy Spirit. He only prayed to the Father because the Father is the only true God. The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit in action, coming down from heaven. And that's why Jesus is the full incarnation of the Holy Spirit of the only true God, the Father, incarnate as a man. The angel spoke to Joseph. The child who has conceived in her is ek out of the Holy Spirit. The context of Hebrews 1, 3 provides irrefutable evidence to show that the Son is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of the Father's person or essence of being who became a human person in the Virgin Mary. Since Matthew 1, 20 plainly informs us that the Christ child was produced literally ek out of the essence of being of the Holy Spirit. 
we know that the Holy Spirit must be the Father's Holy Spirit who descended upon the Hebrew virgin. This is very problematic for the Trinitarian doctrine, which asserts that a distinct God the Son person became incarnate and not the Holy Spirit of the Heavenly Father. Hebrews 1.3 states that the Son was reproduced from the Father's essence of being, while Matthew 1.20 states that the Son was reproduced from the Holy Spirit's essence of being. The child who has been conceived in her is out of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 1.20. The only way to harmonize the scriptural data is to believe that the Holy Spirit's essence of being is the same divine person as the Father who became incarnate which proves oneness modalism while refuting Trinitarianism, Arianism, and Unitarian Sicinianism. Therefore, the weight of the scriptural evidence shows that the divinity of the Holy Spirit of the only true God the Father was united with humanity through Mary's egg to become a distinct man as the Son of the living God. Luke 135 informs us why the Son is called the Son in the first place. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. For that reason the child which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. The Son is called the Son of God because of his miraculous virgin conception out of a woman. Galatians 4.4 4 says the Son was ek, made out of a woman. And Matthew 1.20 says that the Son was reproduced as the image of the invisible Father, ek, out of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, 18 and 20. Therefore, the Son is called the Son of God because of his miraculous virgin conception out of the woman, Virgin Mary, and out of the Holy Spirit of the only true God, the Father. No scripture in the entire Bible ever gives us another reason why the Son of God is called the Son, other than the New Testament reason given in Luke 1, 35. In fact, no scripture in the entire Bible ever states that the Son, as a Son, has always existed as an alleged timeless God the Son person throughout eternity past, which completely demolishes the Trinitarian doctrine. And I've challenged Trinitarian apologists to give me a single verse in the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation where the Son is called the Son for another reason other than the New Testament reason given in Luke 135. No Trinitarian apologist has ever been able to give me an answer to that question. John 5, 26, As the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son to have a life in himself. The Son was clearly granted a human life distinct in himself. Who could pray? Who could be tempted? Who could be led by the Spirit? Here we can clearly see that the Son is the man, and the man is the Son who was granted a distinct human life by God the Father. God the Father granted a distinct life to the Son by supernaturally supplying his own male chromosomes from his own substance or essence of being, hypostasis, Hebrews 1.3, which was reproduced or imprinted within the human egg of the Virgin Mary, Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews 2.3. 14 through 17. He was made fully human in every way. Hebrews 2 17. Acts 20 verse 28 actually says, The church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood, the blood of God. Although there are variant readings of Acts 20 28, the weight of the scriptural evidence points to God's own blood as the phrase Church of God is used throughout the New Testament, but never the Church of the Lord. We never find the words Church of the Lord anywhere in the New Testament. Ellicott's commentary says, and I quote, the fact that elsewhere St. Paul invariably speaks of the Church of God, and then he gives many references, and never the Church of the Lord, is very convincing evidence to show that the correct reading should be the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood rather than the church of the Lord. The variant manuscripts that say the church of the Lord 
in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, are only a few, but there's no other scriptures in the entire New Testament that says Church of the Lord. Clement of Alexandria provides the earliest Christian witness that the text is about the blood of God rather than the blood of the Lord. Now, Clement of Alexandria lived in Alexandria, Egypt and ministered in the very late part of the 2nd century, right up until around 200, just before 200 AD. So we're talking about a very early time period. There is no other early Christian writing earlier than Clement of Alexandria who quoted or cited Acts 20 verse 28. So the early Christian witness, the earliest one that we can find, cites Acts 20 28 as the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood, which is very convincing evidence that the text should read the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Some later variant texts said the church of the Lord which he has purchased with his own blood. But those texts came later. The earliest scriptural evidence we have points to, along with the earliest Christian writings, is that the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood, is the correct translation of the text. Author Deborah Bond wrote, Most cells in the body contain 46 chromosomes. But dad's sperm and mom's egg each contain just 23 chromosomes. When egg meets sperm, they join to form the 46 chromosomes of a single cell that will rapidly divide until it becomes the approximately 100 trillion squirming cells that you lovingly diaper, feed, and babble to all day long. Each chromosome carries many genes which also come in pairs. Since half of your baby's genes come from mommy and the other half from daddy, the probability of a baby getting any particular gene is similar to the probability of flipping a coin. Sounds like predicting the possible combination that makes up your baby's looks and personality should be easy, right? No such luck. Only a few traits, such as blood type, are controlled by a single gene pair. The pair of genes received from both parents. End quote. Richard Halleck wrote, The human blood type is determined by the co-dominant alleles. An allele is one of several different forms of genetic information that is present in our DNA at a specific location on a specific chromosome. There are three different alleles for human blood type, known as I or A, uh, B, and I. For simplicity, we can call these alleles A, B, and O. Each of us has two A, B, O blood type alleles. Because we each inherit one blood type allele from our biological mother and one from our biological father. End quote. Here we find scientific evidence to show that Christ's blood type had to have been out of Mary, his mother, and out of the Holy Spirit as his father. So in a certain sense we can say that the blood of Jesus is the blood of God because God's Spirit miraculously contributed to the blood of the Christ child. Although the blood of Jesus is not ontologically God's blood, because God don't have blood, he's an invisible spirit, we can affirm that Christ's blood belongs to the God who became a man in the Incarnation through the Virgin, because the blood of Jesus belongs to the everlasting Father whose own Holy Spirit became incarnate as a human son. So here we can see a contribution in the person of Jesus from his mother Mary, Eck out of the woman, Galatians 4, 4, and a contribution of supernatural divine DNA or chromosomes from the Holy Spirit, Matthew 1, 20. Eck, he was produced Eck out of the Holy Spirit's essence of being as a fully complete human being. 
Since the Christ child had no biological father, according to the flesh, the Holy Spirit of God himself, who descended upon the virgin, had to miraculously supply the male chromosomes and the male blood type to make Jesus Christ a true male offspring. Hence, Jesus can be said to carry the chromosomes and blood type of Mary and from God himself. Therefore, in a certain sense, the physical body of Jesus can be called the body of God and the blood of God because God himself became a man through the Virgin Mary. Now note, the flesh of Jesus cannot be said to be divine flesh. I'm not saying that Jesus had divine flesh. But the body that belonged to Jesus, the blood of Jesus, is God's body, God's blood, because God became a man. In other words, who owned that body of Jesus Christ? The human spirit of Jesus is God's spirit who became a human spirit. So in a sense, we can say the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus is the body and blood of God himself who took on humanity. Since God became one of us to save us, the physical body of Jesus is God's newly assumed human body. Not God ontologically with us as God, but God ontologically with us as a fully complete human son. Hebrews 2.17 The Holy Spirit came down from heaven to become the Christ child. John 3.13 says, No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. We know that Enoch and Elijah both ascended into heaven. Hence, Christ must have meant that no one living on the earth during the time of Jesus had ever gone up to heaven. Well after Christ's ascension into heaven, the Apostle Paul stated that his spirit was likely taken out of his body into the third heaven, because he said, and I quote, Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. Paul said he heard inexpressible words in heaven, which a man is not permitted to speak. Thus it appears that Paul's human spirit had at least briefly ascended into heaven, just as it also appears that the human spirit of Jesus had briefly ascended into heaven to see and hear heavenly things while still existing on the earth as a man. We find many of the prophets, when they ministered, sometimes they were caught up in the spirit. Even the apostle John was caught up in the spirit. Yet unlike Paul, who later had gone up to heaven as a finite man, Jesus, as the infinite God, was able to come down from heaven while existing in heaven at the self-same time. John the Baptist referred to Jesus when he said, He who comes from heaven is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. John's use of the words, He who comes from heaven is above all, when describing Jesus in John 3.31, points to the one true God of Ephesians 4.10 who is above all, through all and in you all, as our one God and Father who is above all, through us all, and in us all. For who else but God alone can be said to be above all? There's no higher authority than God himself. Jesus clearly came down from heaven as the Holy Spirit of God the Father, incarnate as a true human child born and son given as a man. That is why Jesus is the divine identity himself as Emmanuel, God with us, who is above all of his creation. There can be no doubt that the context of John chapter 3 is addressing Jesus Christ as he who comes from heaven. John spoke of Jesus as the only man who ever came from heaven while simultaneously existing in heaven. Jesus clearly said, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus used the incarnational title, Son of God and Son of Man, to hide his true identity. Isaiah 45, 14 and 15 says, Truly you are a God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. 
Jesus spoke of himself as existing in heaven and on earth at the self-same time. Because only Jesus as God with us as a man is the one who continued to remain above all as God in heaven while simultaneously existing as a man on the earth. John then contrasted the one who is, who comes from heaven, who is above all, with human beings of the earth. Because no one else but Jesus can be said to have come down from heaven while existing in heaven at the same time. The prophets, including John, were men of the earth who received authority from heaven to preach the word of God and give God's commandments to the people. It is in this light that Jesus said that the baptism of John was from heaven. But no mere mortal prophet could ever say that he actually came down from heaven like Jesus did in John 6.38 when he said, I came down from heaven while continuing to be in heaven as the Lord above all. The same is true in 1 Corinthians 15.47 which clearly states that the first man, Adam, originated by being created of the earth, while the Lord Jesus had his true origin as the Lord from heaven. 1 Corinthians 15.47 1 Corinthians 15.45-47 in the NASB says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. So Jesus, unlike Adam, came from heaven. Now we know we were all predestined of God. Ephesians 1.4 says he chose us in him before the creation of the world. This is not talking about God's predestined elect coming down from heaven. No, this is talking about Jesus Christ coming down from heaven, not just as an elected son, but he came down from heaven as the Spirit of God, according to Matthew 1.20 and Luke 1.35. Both texts say that the Holy Spirit descended upon the virgin and that the Son was ek, made out or reproduced out of the Holy Spirit's essence of being. So we know that the Spirit of God came down from heaven. Jesus is called the second man is from heaven as opposed to the earthly man, Adam. Notice the contrast between Adam and Jesus. The context of 1 Corinthians 15, 45-47 is dealing with Adam as the first man whose origin was from the earth, earthly. But the second man is from heaven because his origin came from heaven. Adam could never have been said to come from heaven. Adam didn't come down from heaven to become a man, no. But we find Jesus being the Lord from heaven, the Spirit of God from heaven who came down from heaven to become a man. So in contradistinction, Jesus came from heaven because he also exists as the Spirit of God who descended upon the Virgin Mary. That is why the apostles identified the Spirit of Christ as the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So the Spirit of God descended upon the Virgin Mary, who was in the prophets, according to 1 Peter 1, 11, and who was that spiritual rock who followed the Israelites in the wilderness. So here we find that Jesus pre-existed his virgin conception and birth as the Spirit of God, which was in the prophets. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21. But 1 Peter 1.11 identifies that Spirit as the Spirit of Christ, who was in the prophets. And again, 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4 and verse 9 inform us that Jesus is that spiritual rock that followed the Israelites in the wilderness. And Jesus pre-existed in, according to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9, we should not test Christ as some of them did. So what the apostles were doing was they were identifying 
the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Lord from heaven, as that spiritual rock. God is our rock, our heavenly Father, whose spirit followed the Israelites in the wilderness. Since the Greek text in 1 Corinthians 10.9 states that the Israelites tested Christ, the Greek text says Christos, we know that Christ is the Israelites' rock, who is that Spirit of God the Father, who the Israelites tested in the wilderness. John 6.38 For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Since no verse in the Bible ever says that God is God, has more than one divine will and consciousness, we know that God also assumed a new human nature and will when his own Holy Spirit came down from heaven to become the Christ child. Thus Jesus was speaking as a fully complete man when he claimed to have come down from heaven, past tense, to assume a human nature and a human will as a distinct human son with a life in himself. Therefore, the man Christ Jesus knew by revelation that he had come down from heaven as the Spirit of God before becoming the Christ child with a distinct human will. While God's prophets received authority from heaven, none of the prophets ever said that they came down from heaven like Jesus said he came down from heaven. We know that heavenly angels and God's Holy Spirit are spoken of as coming down or descending from heaven. But no scripture or Jewish literature that I'm aware of ever spoke of a man who came down from heaven like the scriptures say about Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus Christ is clearly the he who partook of flesh and blood as the one who shared in their humanity to be made fully human in every way, according to Hebrews 2, 14-17, as a true man living among men who could suffer and die for our sins. If Jesus was born as just a mere mortal man with no pre-existence whatsoever, how could Jesus be called the one who is the Lord from heaven? The first man is from the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. As the God who was manifested in the flesh justified in the spirit. Scripture informs us that the Spirit of God and the spirits of the angels come down from heaven. Matthew 3.16 says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. So we know the Spirit of God can descend from heaven. John 1.32 John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove, out of heaven, and he remained upon him. The omnipresent Holy Spirit of God the Father, who descended upon the Virgin to be manifested in the flesh, and to partake of flesh and blood as the Christ child, later descended out of heaven at Christ's baptism. Because God, as God, can never leave heaven. So the, the same Holy Spirit who came down from heaven to become incarnate as Christ, is the same Holy Spirit of the Father who continued to exist in heaven even after Christ was conceived in the Virgin Mary. So the Holy Spirit of God the Father who came down from heaven, manifested himself in the flesh, partook of flesh and blood, according to Hebrews 2.14, as the Christ child, later descended out of heaven at Christ's baptism to show John, the prophet John, John the Baptist, that Jesus was the true Messiah. The angel informed Mary that the Holy Spirit would descend from heaven to make the Christ child as the reproduced copy of the Father's substance of being as a fully complete human being. Therefore, we know that the Holy Spirit of the Father who became the Christ child also continued to remain as the omnipresent Spirit of the Father who continually led and filled Jesus as a true man living among men. Just because God's Spirit became incarnate doesn't mean that God could vacate heaven. God as God cannot vacate heaven even for a moment or else he wouldn't be God. Only God can simultaneously exist in the incarnation as the man Christ Jesus while simultaneously existing as the unchangeable heavenly Father who fills the heavens and the earth. 
No human being in Scripture other than Jesus ever claimed to have come down from heaven because only angels and God himself have come down from heaven within the past historical accounts of inspired Scripture. For no man has ever been physically created in heaven to become a man a second time down on the earth by being born of a woman. Although holy angels have come down from heaven to appear as men, no angelic creation has ever come down from heaven to be born as a human being. For God never said to any of the angels, You are my son this day, have I given birth to you. Daniel 4.13 says, I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. Scripture informs us that God's Spirit and the heavenly angels can come down from heaven, but no human prophet ever claimed to have come down from heaven while simultaneously existing in heaven at the selfsame time other than Jesus. Which clearly refutes Arianism, which says that Jesus is just a special angelic creation. And Unitarian Socinianism, which postulates that Jesus is just a special man with no actual pre-existence at all. Since our Heavenly Father has said, There is none like me, in Isaiah 46, 9, the Son of God's true identity could not have been an angelic creation, which is Arianism, like Jehovah's Witnesses teach, or only a man with no existence outside of his humanity. That's Unitarian Socinianism. For only God alone has the divine attribute of omnipresence, being in heaven and on earth at the selfsame time, in order to hear and answer prayers. Jesus said in John 14, 14, If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So, Jesus' ability to be omnipresent clearly refutes Arianism, because no angels can be omnipresent like God. Even Satan, who's, who was Lucifer, who was an archangel, he's going to be bound in a bottomless pit for a thousand years. Satan is not omnipresent. No archangel is omnipresent. This clearly refutes Arianism or Jehovah's Witness type teaching. And it also refutes Unitarian Socinianism because there's no way any mere man can be omnipresent to hear and answer prayers like God. Isaiah 46, 9 says, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Since Jesus is like God, we honor the Son just as we honor the Father, then he must be that God who came to save us as a man. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete, literally advocate and intercessor. The word parakletos, anglicized paraclete in English, has a wide variety of meanings. Most generally it means an advocate or an intercessor. It also has the connotation of meaning a helper, comforter, a mediator, one who mediates. Okay, This chart here shows all the, the wide range of meanings that the word paraclete literally means in the Greek text. John 14, 26 says, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said unto you. Now think about it for a minute. If the Holy Spirit is a pre-incarnate God the Holy Spirit person who never became incarnate, how on earth can a co-equal God the Holy Spirit advocate, intercede for our case before God the Father, and mediate before God? Certainly we only have one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So God's Holy Spirit, as the unchangeable Holy Spirit in the heavens, cannot advocate, cannot make intercession, which involves praying. Can God, as God, pray to God? Jesus as a man prayed to God. Jesus as a man is our advocate, our helper, our comforter, our mediator. There's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So this scripture in John 14, 26 actually proves that the Holy Spirit became incarnate as the Christ child because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son of God 
after the incarnation, in the incarnation to the Virgin, yet the same Holy Spirit of God remained the Spirit of the Father in heaven who never had to change. Because the Spirit of God can never leave heaven. He can never vacate heaven when his own arm was revealed. That's why I love Isaiah 53, 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? God extended himself into our world by his own arm. He extended his own essence of being into our world to save his people from their sins while retaining his divine identity and unchangeability as our Heavenly Father who can never lose his divine attributes as God. So God as God cannot advocate or intercede to God because God as God is the supreme deity who cannot advocate or intercede for anyone because God as God is the highest authority. So how then can the Holy Spirit be our advocate, our intercessor, some who intercedes for us, our mediator? It's impossible. The only way that this could be true in John 14, 26 is that Jesus is the Spirit of Truth who was with the disciples in John 14, 16 through 18, who would later be in the disciples when he said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you, John 14, 18, 17, 18. So the scriptures affirm that God who continued to exist unchangeably in the heavens also became a distinct man in the incarnation. God as man in the incarnation through the virgin can intercede to God on the behalf of humanity, but God as God outside the incarnation as the Holy Spirit of the Father cannot intercede for anyone, cannot advocate for anyone. So here we find that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ because God also became a son, a man who advocates and intercedes for us. This scripture in John 14, 26 refutes Trinitarianism, Arianism, and Unitarian Sicinianism because the Holy Spirit of the Father is clearly Jesus Christ who is our advocate our intercessor, and our mediator who helps us. No verse in the Bible ever says that we have two mediators between God and men, the man Christ Jesus and the third God, the Holy Spirit person. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's only one God who is our Heavenly Father and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So who is the Holy Spirit here in John 14.26? God incarnate, the Holy Spirit who hovered over the Virgin, the Holy Spirit who came down from heaven and produced a man-child. Matthew 1, 18-20 says, Ek, the Son was produced Ek out of the essence of being of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. He's God manifest in the flesh. And he is the God who partook of flesh and blood to share in our humanity and was made fully human in every way in order to save his people from their sins. Romans 8, 26, 27 informs us that the Holy Spirit of God makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Thus proving that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit who became the man Christ Jesus as our paraclete who advocates and intercedes for us to our Heavenly Father. There is no other way to get around this, these texts of Scripture. The only theology that brings harmony to all the scriptural data is oneness theology. The ancient counterpart was modalistic monarchianism. That's what scholars say. I'm not saying that we need to call ourselves modalistic monarchians. But we call ourselves oneness because we believe that the one God is a single monarch, single king, who came to save us in a different manifestation as a true man. His own Holy Spirit came down from heaven to become a man. Jesus is clearly the Holy Spirit according to inspired scripture. 1 Corinthians 12, 3-5 says, Therefore I inform you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. 
The context of 1 Corinthians 12, 3-5 informs us that no one can affirm that Jesus is Lord with the understanding that Jesus is the same Spirit, verse 4, as the same Lord without receiving revelation from the Holy Spirit of God Himself. The Trinity doctrine teaches that the Spirit is not the Lord Jesus and that the Lord Jesus is not the Spirit. Yet the context of 1 Corinthians 12, 3-5 clearly addresses the Lord Jesus as the same Lord who is the same Spirit. The same Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Paul repeated himself by affirming that the Lord is the Spirit in 2 Corinthians 3.17 within the context of affirming Christ Jesus as the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4.5 For no one can know the true identity of Jesus except it be given to him from the Spirit of God. No one knows who the Son is except the Father and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So it takes revelation to understand who Christ Jesus really is. You're not going to get this just by using your own finite mind. The only way to understand who Jesus Christ is, to know him as Lord, is by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. So Jesus is the one who reveals the Father. So that we, it takes a spiritual revelation for Christ in you to understand who he really is. The Holy Spirit of God is completely absent from Christ's words in Luke 10, 22. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Since it is impossible for the Holy Spirit of God to not know who the Son is, we know that the Holy Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father who is also the same Spirit of the Son in the Incarnation through the Virgin. God's true elect will have this revelation, but those who do not receive this revelation are still blinded by the devil. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to those that are lost, in whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, image of the invisible Father should shine unto them. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 clearly says Jesus is Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 goes on to state that the Lord is the Spirit. Since Paul also wrote 2 Corinthians 4, 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, we know that the Lord is the Spirit in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, being addressed in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. Trinitarian doctrine is supposed to believe that the Son is not the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. However, Scripture clearly states that the Lord is the Spirit. Jesus is Lord, He is the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 to 5 says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. The Lord is the Spirit. Since Jesus is Lord in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, He must be the one being addressed as the same Spirit and as the same Lord in verses 4 and 5. When we compare these facts with Romans 8, 9, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, used interchangeably, John 14, 16-18, Colossians 1, 27, we find that Jesus is the indwelling Holy Spirit of God Himself. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Notice how the Spirit of God is called the same Lord as the Spirit of Christ. John 14, 16 through 18, Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, paraclete, advocate, intercessor, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him. But you know Him, the Spirit of Truth, because He, the Spirit of Truth, abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Since John 14, 26 identifies the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, as the paraclete, 
And John 14, 6 through 18 identifies Jesus as the paraclete, advocate, intercessor. Jesus the Lord must be the same Holy Spirit of the Father who became incarnate as the Son of God. Otherwise, an alleged co-equally distinct God the Holy Spirit could not be said to be co-equal while advocating and interceding for humanity as a mediator or a go-between between God and man. For how can an alleged non-incarnate God the Holy Spirit person be said to be a paraclete who advocates and intercedes for humanity? Interceding involves praying. Can God as God intercede to God? Since Jesus is our only mediator as our advocate and intercessor, our mediator between God and men, the indwelling Holy Spirit must be the Spirit of His Son who makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8, 26, 27 proves that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, makes intercession for the saints. God as God cannot intercede for the saints, but God with us as a man, Jesus Christ, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God, who is our Heavenly Father. The context of Romans 8, 9, Romans 8, 26, 27, and Romans 8, 34 proves that Christ Jesus is the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us. 1 John 2, 1 identifies Jesus as the paraclete. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Romans 8, 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not of his. So the Holy Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ, according to Romans 8, 9. Only oneness theology teaches that the Father's Holy Spirit came down from heaven to become a man as the Spirit of Christ. This explains why the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are spoken of interchangeably as the self-same indwelling Spirit. In contradistinction, Trinitarian theology teaches that a second co-equally distinct God the Son person came down from heaven to become a human son. Such an erroneous idea is very problematic for the Trinitarian position because Scripture proves that the Holy Spirit came down from heaven to conceive the Christ child who was made ek out of the Holy Spirit rather than out of an alleged co-equally distinct God the Son person. Could a God the Son have vacated heaven to become a human son? While most Trinitarian scholars and theologians confess that an alleged co-equal God the Son never lost his divine attributes by vacating heaven to become a man, most lay Trinitarians and even some scholarly Trinitarian apologists I have dialogued with confess a belief that a God the Son left heaven and temporarily lost his omnidivine attributes in order to become a man in the Incarnation. Both Trinitarian views are problematic for several reasons. Therefore, I am presenting a detailed, wondrous response explaining why both Trinitarian views cannot bring harmony to all the scriptural data. Trinitarians who believe that a God the Son lost his omnipresence and divine attributes by vacating heaven to become a man usually employ the familiar kenosis view by misunderstanding the meaning of emptying, keno, in Philippians 2, 5-9, in their thinking. They assume that a God the Son emptied himself of his divine attributes in order to become a man. Yet how could God cease being God for a while while violating Malachi 3, 6? I am Yahweh, I change not. And Hebrews 13, 8. The divinity of Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the divinity of the one who became incarnate as the man Christ Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3.6, God says, I am Yahweh, I change not. So Yahweh as Yahweh cannot change by ever losing his divine attributes, such as omnipresence, filling the heavens and the earth. According to Trinitarian scholar R.C. Sproul, if God laid aside one of his attributes, the immutable undergoes a mutation. The infinite suddenly stops being infinite. It would be the end of the universe. End quote. Under the subtitle, Canonic Theology, Trinitarian theologian Dan Musick wrote, and I quote, 
Most canonicists believe that Christ gave up his sovereign dominion when becoming incarnate. They follow the same logic as the Arians, those who deny the true divinity of Jesus. But they are deceived into thinking that their Christ is still God. These could be classified as Neo-Arians. Dan Music is himself a Trinitarian, but he readily admits that Trinitarians who believe that Christ gave up his divine attributes to become a man could be classified as Neo-Arians. Arianism denies the full deity of Christ because Arianism teaches a lesser God person rather than a co-equal God person. Under implications of the canonic theology, Dan Music went on to write, If by becoming a man, Christ gave up the use of his divine attributes in any way, then he was not sovereign. If Jesus was not sovereign during his earthly ministry, then he was not God. If he was not God, the word that was God never became flesh, only part of the word did. And the name Emmanuel, meaning God with us, is a lie. And God's word is not true. In order for the God the Son to abandon his sovereignty in any way, he would have to change his character or being. This God would never do. I am who I am. But thou art the same, and thy years will not come to an end. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. End quote. Inspired scripture itself proves that it is impossible for the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to change by leaving his omnidivine attributes in heaven when he became a man. For Jesus did not say before Abraham was, I was, as if he was God back then, or if he was once the great I am before losing his divine presence and his divine attributes by vacating heaven. When Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, he was saying that he still existed as the great, omnipresent I am, as the true God, who simultaneously existed as God in heaven, as well as existing as God with men on the earth, as a true man among men. Therefore, Jesus was still the great I am, who always filled heaven and earth, both in eternity past and even while he walked this earth as a man. Jesus informed us in John 3.13 that he simultaneously existed in heaven and on earth at the same time. Since it is impossible for a mere man to be in heaven and on earth at the same time, we know that he had to be addressing his true identity as the omnipresent Spirit of God who fills heaven and earth. For the true identity of the Son of Man, the title Son of Man is the Son of Mankind through Mary, not a divine title of God that he's always used. This is a title involving sonship. The Son of Man means the Son of Mankind through Mary. So the true identity of the Son of Man is the same divine individual who simultaneously existed as the mighty God and everlasting Father in heaven while dwelling on the earth as a man. An uninformed Trinitarian responded to me in writing by saying, and I quote, You have the Father changing to the Son. Laugh out loud. This is a change. And also losing his divine attributes. End quote. This enthusiastic Trinitarian was defending his finite idea that the Son lost his divine presence and attributes in heaven to become a man. So in his thinking, the Father also had to lose his divine presence and attributes in heaven in order to become a man. Here is how he responded to him. No verse of scripture ever says that the Father changed into the Son by leaving or losing his divine attributes to become a man. For the scriptures inform us that Jesus is the arm of Yahweh as the anthropomorphic arm of our Heavenly Father himself revealed. Can the Father's arm be another distinct divine person from himself? If Jesus is the arm of Yahweh God the Son, then that Yahweh person could not have left heaven in the Incarnation. So either way, your view that God vacated heaven to become a man is absolutely false. I continue. 
Now, if an alleged God the Son never left heaven in the Incarnation, then you also have a dilemma to explain how an omnipresent God the Son could act and speak in heaven while simultaneously acting and speaking on the earth as a man. This also sounds like you have two Son persons. A God the Son and a human Son who could speak and act independently from one another at the same time. Thus, Trinitarians also cannot intellectually explain how the omnipresent God can become a true man through the Virgin while simultaneously retaining his omnipresence and divine attributes in heaven. No human being can adequately describe the miraculous nature of the Incarnation because the Bible says that it was a miracle. Irenaeus wrote that it is indescribable to fully comprehend how the Son was produced by the Father. And I quote, If anyone says to us, How then was the Son produced by the Father? We reply to him, That no man understands that production and generation, or calling, or by whatever name one may describe his generation which is in fact altogether indescribable, but the Father alone who begat and the Son who was begotten. Since therefore his generation is unspeakable, those who strive to set forth generations and productions cannot be right in their mind inasmuch as they undertake to describe things which are undescribable." End quote. No finite human being can adequately describe how God produced the Son from his own essence of being, as a fully complete human being. As a true man through the virgin birth, Jesus is not ontologically God as God, because Jesus is God with us as a true man. God is not ontologically a man according to Numbers 23.19. God is not a man nor a son of man. God was not ontologically a man before the Incarnation, and he is not ontologically a man after the Incarnation either. For the flesh of Jesus is not literally God as God, nor is the human spirit of Jesus literally God as God. For when God became a man, he became something ontologically distinct from God, a true man. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is not God. What I'm saying is that God reproduced an image of himself, his own essence of being, became a human being. An eager Trinitarian wrote, God is omnipresent. He is past, present, and future. He is beyond our little dimensional understanding. End quote. I initially respected her for such a wise and scriptural statement. But then she went on to write that a God the Son left heaven to become a man. Hence, she was confessing that two God persons were always omnipresent. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, past, present, and in the future, while the other God person, namely the Son, was not always omnipresent. I have found that most professing Trinitarians erroneously believe it to be impossible for God to remain in heaven while simultaneously becoming a man as the arm of Yahweh himself revealed to save his people from their sins. That is why human minds began developing the Trinitarian doctrine. For our finite minds have a hard time fathoming how God could act and speak in more than one geographical locality at once. However, the miraculous nature of the omnipresent God empowers him to be able to act and speak as God in heaven while simultaneously acting and speaking independently as a true man among men in order to save us from our sins. Trinitarians who believe that a God the Son emptied himself of his divine attributes have an alleged co-equal God the Son changing in violation of Malachi 3.6, I am Yahweh, I change not. And Hebrews 13.18, as to Christ's true divinity, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Obviously, his humanity is not the same yesterday, today, and forever. But as to his true divine identity, Jesus is the Christ. He is the same as to his true divinity, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Trinitarians have a God the Son emptying himself of his divine attributes. They have an alleged co-equal God the Son changing by not remaining the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
the true identity of the divinity of Jesus had to remain the same in heaven while he simultaneously became a true man who could pray and be tempted. For if Yahweh as God could ever change by losing any of his divine attributes, then Malachi 3.6 and Hebrews 13.8 would be untrue. Only the Father in heaven knows all things, while the human child born and son given could not have known all things in his human limitations. Jesus clearly grew in wisdom and stature. The Almighty as the Almighty cannot grow in wisdom, but Emmanuel, God with us as a true man, could grow in wisdom as well as pray and be tempted of the devil. Mark 13.32 only presents a problem for Trinitarians. For how could no one know the day or the hour, no, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone? How could an alleged co-equal omniscient God, the Holy Spirit, not know something? And if the majority of Trinitarian theologians were correct in affirming that a God the Son never lost his omnipresence in heaven when he simultaneously became a man, then how could a God the Son who should have also been in heaven as a Son person, while dwelling on the earth as a man, also not know the day and the hour of his own second coming? Mark 13.32 clearly says, No one knows the day or the hour. No, not the angels in heaven. So we're talking about beings in heaven not knowing the day or the hour of Christ's second coming. Nor the Son who Trinitarians allege was in heaven. At least most theologians do, anyhow. But the Father alone. So the Holy Spirit is completely completely absent here. And the Son, as a co-equal, unchangeable Son, according to Hebrews 13, 8, he should have known also up in heaven what was going on and what, what as an omniscient God person, he should have known the day and the hour. So here we find clear evidence that the Father alone is the only true God who knows all things. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. That's why Jesus didn't mention the Holy Spirit in Mark 13, 32. Because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. So the majority of Trinitarian theologians, if they were correct in affirming that a God the Son never lost his omnipresence in heaven, when he simultaneously became a man, then how could a God the Son as a heavenly Son, who should have also been in heaven as a Son, while also dwelling on the earth as a man, also not know the day and the hour of his own second coming. For the text clearly states, no one knows the day or the hour, no, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. The inspired text is addressing individuals in heaven, as well as individuals on the earth. Although Trinitarians cannot answer these questions, Oneness believers have no problem understanding this seemingly difficult passage of Scripture. An alleged omnipresent God the Son in heaven would have known the day and the hour of Christ's second coming, while the earthly Son would not have known that time. Thus, there could be no heavenly second God the Son person living in heaven outside of the Son's human existence on the earth. Since the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father, the Holy Spirit is not listed in Mark 13, 32, along with the Father. Hence, there could be no distinct heavenly God, the Holy Spirit person, either. That is why Jesus said that the Father alone knows the day and the hour of Christ's second coming. For the Holy Spirit of the Father alone is the only true God who knows all things. I have already proved that the Holy Spirit of the Father is the true divinity of the Son who retained his omnipresence and divine attributes in heaven while he simultaneously existed as a man on the earth. Thus, there is no way to believe in the deity of Christ other than believing that Jesus exists outside of the Incarnation as the unchangeable Father alone who knows all things while the Son is the man who did not know all things. For God, as God, is the Father outside of the Incarnation who knows all things, whilst the Son is God with us as a man inside of the Incarnation who does not know all things as a man.
No Trinitarian has ever been able to answer my challenge to cite a single verse where Jesus ever claimed his own divine identity as a coically distinct God the Son person beside the Father. Jesus always confessed that the deity in him was the Father, but he never claimed that the divinity in him was ever a distinct God the Son person. So where is the divine dignity and believability of the so-called Trinitarian God the Son person? Jesus clearly said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. Here we see that to see Jesus is not to see a co-equally distinct God the Son person, but to see Jesus is to see the divine person of the Father. And to believe in Jesus is not to believe in a co-equally distinct God the Son person, but to believe in Jesus is to believe in the deity of the only true God, the Father. For the one true God, who is the Father, also produced an express image of his person as a fully complete human person in the incarnation through the Virgin in order to save us. A spirit-filled prophet from India heard Jesus say to him, Man also has a natural desire that he should see him and whom he believes and who loves him. But the Father cannot be seen, for he is by nature incomprehensible, and he who would comprehend him must have the same nature. But man is a comprehensible creature, and being so cannot see God. Since, however, God is love, and he has given to man that same faculty of love, therefore, in order that craving for love might be satisfied, he adopted a form of existence that man could comprehend. Thus he became man, and his children with all the holy angels may see him and enjoy him. Therefore I said that he that has seen me has seen the Father. And although while in the form of man I am called the Son, I am the eternal and everlasting Father, end quote from Sadhu Sundar Singh, an Indian prophet. The earliest Christians who immediately succeeded the first century apostles also taught the full humanity and divinity of Jesus Christ, just like I am teaching in this book. Clement of Rome was a first century Roman bishop who was taught by the first century apostles. Clement wrote that we ought to think of Jesus Christ as of God himself. To Clement chapter 1. Brethren, it is fitting that you should think of Jesus Christ as of God, as the judge of the living and the dead. 2 Clement chapter 1 goes on to state, Jesus Christ submitted to suffer for our sakes. What return then shall we make to him, or what fruit shall be worthy of that which has been given to us? For indeed, how great are the benefits which we owe to him. He has graciously given us light as a father, he has called us sons. He has saved us when we were ready to perish. What praise then shall we give to him, or what return shall we make for the things which he, we have received? End quote. Notice that there is nothing within the text to indicate that the subject has changed from Jesus Christ to God the Father. Hence Clement of Rome identified Jesus Christ as the Father. 2 Clement 14, 3-4 states that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit, which is Christ. And I quote, The Holy Spirit goes on to say, Guard the flesh that you may partake of the Spirit. Now if we say that the flesh is the church and the Spirit is Christ, then verily he who has dishonored the flesh has dishonored the church. Such a one therefore shall not partake of the Spirit, which is Christ. Trinity doctrine says that the Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit. But 2 Clement clearly says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit, which is Christ. Later, Trinitarian doctrine states that the Holy Spirit is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit. Yet to Clement and the first century Roman Christians, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit, which is Christ. In Clement's first epistle, Clement spoke of Jesus Christ as being chosen as a true man along with God's elect. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. And I quote, 1 Clement chapter 58, May God who sees all things and who is the ruler of all spirits 
and the Lord of all flesh, who chose our Lord Jesus Christ and us through him to be a peculiar people. Grant to every soul that calls upon his glorious and holy name, faith, fear, peace, patience, long-suffering, and self-control, purity and sobriety, to the well-pleasing of his name through our high priest and protector, Jesus Christ. Notice that Clement wrote that God chose our Lord Jesus Christ and us. So Clement taught the full humanity and pre-existence as far as the foreknowledge of God. Christ. In other words, God's elect were foreknown before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. Ephesians 1 4. Likewise, the Son, Christ Jesus the Lord, was chosen before the creation of the world. God as God cannot be chosen along with his human us human beings as God's elect, nor can God as God be our high priest, who mediates and intercedes for humanity. Therefore, like the first century apostles, Clement also taught the full humanity and deity of Jesus Christ. Hermas of Rome wrote that the Son of God pre-existed as the Holy Spirit. Hermas Parable 5.6 The pre-existent Holy Spirit which created all things did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself. Before becoming the same Holy Spirit incarnate as a man who now attends to God and intercedes to God as our mediator. Hermas Book 2, Commandment 5.1 says but if any outburst of anger take place, forthwith the Holy Spirit, who is tender, is straightened, not having a pure place, and he seeks to depart out of the one who is filled with the Spirit, for he is choked by the vile spirit inside the human vessel and cannot attend on the Lord as he wishes. How can an alleged non-incarnate, co-equal God the Holy Spirit person be said to attend on the Lord or the Father as he wishes? while remaining co-equal with the Lord. For an alleged non-incarnate, co-equally distinct God, the Holy Spirit person, cannot intercede to God and attend on God while being truly co-equal. The only viable answer is that the indwelling Holy Spirit of the Father is the same Spirit who became a man as His Son. God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6. Because the Holy Spirit of God, the Father, also became the Son in the Incarnation through the Virgin. This explains why the Holy Spirit, who came down from heaven on the Virgin to become a fully complete human Son, now attends to God and intercedes to God as the life-giving Spirit who fills all New Testament believers. Ignatius of Antioch wrote that God became a true human being in the Incarnation through the Virgin. God himself being manifested in human form for the renewal of eternal life. And now that took a beginning which had been prepared by God. So Ignatius wrote that God became a true human being in the incarnation through the virgin by taking on a beginning. God as God could not have took a beginning as it was the man Christ Jesus who had a beginning by a supernatural virgin conception. Since Jesus is God who became a man, the man Christ Jesus needed to have a God, pray to God, and be led by the Spirit of God, or he would not have been a true man at all. For the one true God also became one true man, who was both made as man and not made as God. Ignatius to the Ephesians 7, 2 says, and I quote, There is one physician who has possessed both the flesh and spirit, both made, created as a son, and not made, not created as God. God existing in the flesh, end quote. The deity of Jesus is the Father. The Trinitarian doctrine says that an alleged distinct God the Son, who is not the Father, incarnated himself as the man Christ Jesus. Yet not a single verse of Scripture ever says that an alleged heavenly God the Son came down from heaven to become incarnate as a human son. Since the scriptures prove that Jesus is the full incarnation of the Holy Spirit of the only true God the Father, rather than alleged incarnation of a second distinct heavenly God the Son person, the entire Trinity doctrine collapses. Colossians 1.19 clearly says, For it pleased the Father that in Him, in Christ, all fullness should dwell. Colossians 2.9 For in Him, Christ, dwells all the fullness of the deity in bodily form. The King James Version says Godhead, from the Greek word theotes, literally means divinity. For in him 
in Christ dwells all the fullness of the divinity in bodily form. John 14.10, Jesus said, The Father who dwells in me, he does the works. So there's only one divinity in Christ, and that is the Father. Whenever the Son of God spoke of the deity within him, he always referenced God the Father as that deity, which spoke through him and did the mighty works through him. Therefore, Jesus, as a fully complete human son, said that his word was not really his word, but the Father's word who sent him. John 14.10 says, The words that I speak to you, I do not speak from myself, but the Father dwelling in me does his works. How could a co-equal God the Son have not been able to speak his own words and do his own works as a co-equal divine God the Son person? And why is it that only God the Father spoke through him and did the mighty works through him rather than the other two alleged co-equally distinct divine persons? According to the Trinitarian position, each of the three alleged distinct God persons are supposed to be co-equal with each other. Why then were the other two alleged co-equally distinct God persons not co-equally active while the Son dwelt on the earth as a man? John 14, 23, 24 says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. The Greek word is logos in the Greek text. And the word, the Logos which you hear, is not mine, but the Father's word, the Father's Logos who sent me. Notice how Jesus' word, his own expressed thought, Logos, was not really his own expressed thought, but rather his expressed thought was really the Father's Logos expressed thought who sent him. So even when Jesus spoke his word, his Logos, we know that his words were not really his own, but the Father's Logos, the Father's expressed thoughts who sent him. This is not what we would expect if the Holy Spirit and the Son were co-equally distinct God persons. Since Jesus' words were not really his own, but the Father's, we know that the divinity within him was truly the deity of God the Father manifest in the flesh. Jesus, as a Son, spoke the words of God the Father and did the mighty works of God the Father, because he is the full incarnation of the Holy Spirit of God the Father himself, who became a man to save us from our sins through the Virgin. Therefore, the Trinitarian doctrine of two other co-equally distinct God persons is patently false. John 12, 44-45 says, Jesus cried. He cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. How could a co-equally distinct God person not have his own divine dignity and believability? If God was really three distinct persons, then Jesus should have said something like this. He who believes in me does not just believe in me, but also in the Father and the Holy Spirit. Since Jesus left out believing in himself and the Holy Spirit as co-equally distinct divine persons, it is clear that the Father alone is the only true God who was manifested in the man Christ Jesus. John 14, 8, 9 says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long a time with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Notice how Jesus as a man claimed that seeing him and believing in him was to see and believe in the only true God, the Father who sent him. Thus, when we believe on Jesus, we do not really believe on him, but in the deity of the Father who sent him. And when we see Jesus, we do not really see him, but we are seeing the deity of the Father who sent him. Because we know that Jesus is the only image of the invisible Father that we will ever see, because the invisible God became a man. These words do not sound anything like the words of a co-equal God the Son person of a three-person trinity. Because the man Christ Jesus was reflecting the divine glory of the only true God the Father himself alone. Acts 2.17 proves that the Father poured out his Holy Spirit upon all flesh starting on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2.17 and I quote, It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. 
Yet John identified Jesus as the one who would baptize God's people with the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11 I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Since the true identity of Jesus is the omnipresent Holy Spirit of God the Father incarnate as a true man, Jesus can send his own Holy Spirit down to earth as the Father, just as he could resurrect his own body as the Father. Acts 2.32 informs us that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. God raised this Jesus to life, Acts 2.32. Likewise, John 5.21 states that it is the Father who raises the dead and gives them life. Yet John 2.19 informs us that Jesus raised his own body from the dead when he said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he spoke of the temple of his body. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit as the Father, just as he raised up his own body as the Father. This proves that Jesus did the works of his Father because he is the deity of God the Father incarnate as a true man. Jesus as God the Father as a true man said in John 10.37 that he did the works of his Father. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, notice that Jesus acknowledged that he did the works of his Father. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that she may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in him. Why would an alleged co-equal God the Son say that he did the works of his Father? If he was a distinct co-equal true God the Son person of an alleged three-person deity, then he should have been able to speak his own words and do his own works. A man may have some of his characteristics of his Father, but no man could ever say that he actually does the works of his father unless he is that father. This has to be true because God the Father said in Isaiah 46, 9, I am God, there is none like me. Since Jesus did the works of his father, he must be that father. There is none like me, speaking of the father. Wherefore, Jesus is the only man in human history who did the works of God the Father because the divine in Christ is the deity of the Father. That is why Jesus as God the Father as a man has the power to send his own Holy Spirit down to the earth in John 15 26 just as he as God the Father had the power to resurrect his own body in John 2 19. Since no mere created being can do the works of God the Father without violating Isaiah 46 9 the Messiah's true identity must be God with us as a man. Isaiah 46, 9 says, I am God, and there is none like me. Since Jesus is like God and doing the works of God the Father, he must be that Father who came to save us as a man. John 20, 17 clearly states that the Son is the man who has a God. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. How can a co-equal God, the Son, have a God while being truly co-equal? Thus, Trinitarians have the same difficulties explaining how Jesus is God, who became a man, as us oneness believers. Jesus was so fully, completely human that he prayed to God as his God, and was even tempted of evil as a true man. An enthusiastic Trinitarian responded to my comments showing that Jesus was addressing the Pharisees about himself being the deity of the Father in John chapter 8, verses 24, 27, 58. The Trinitarian wrote, They were law-keeping Jews. They were of the thinking that there was only one God and that Jesus was not him. That's why Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I responded to him by writing, Here you admitted that the Jews knew only one God as the Father, and that they believed that Jesus was not him. Then he wrote, That's why Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Here you have actually admitted that Jesus was addressing the deity of the Father in verse 27. For why would Jesus say, Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, if he was speaking about himself as a second God person of a trinity that the Jews knew nothing about? 
Thus, your response is a nonsensical argument from an unknown second God the Son person of a three-person deity that the Jewish people knew nothing about. According to Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is clearly the brightness of his glory, the Father's glory, and the imprint or imprinted copy, facsimile, reproduction of his, the Father's person. Why does the Son only reflect the brightness of the Father if he is an alleged co-equal Yahweh God the Son person? Should not a co-equal true God person have his own divine brightness and glory? Since the Son merely reflects the divine brightness and glory of God the Father, he must be the image and brightness of the invisible Father with us as a true man. Furthermore, how can Trinitarians explain how a God the Son has always existed as an imprinted copy, facsimile, as a reproduced copy of the Father's person as a timeless Son throughout eternity past? There is no way to get around the fact that an imprint or copy requires a time when it was imprinted or copied from an original substance of being. Hence, the scriptures prove that the Holy Spirit of the Father imprinted a reproduced copy of his own substance of being as a fully complete human being within the Hebrew virgin. Trinitarians who believe that a God the Son vacated heaven and lost his divine attributes to become a man also state that all three God persons are co-equal. Yet when they are confronted with verses which do not fit their theology, they insist that the divine attributes of one Yahweh person can change while the other two alleged co-equal persons cannot change. But how can one co-equal God person be truly co-equal with the other two? When one can vacate heaven and lose all of his divine attributes to become a man. Such a view violates Malachi 3.6 and Hebrews 13.8. Jesus cannot be the same yesterday, today, and forever if he changed by losing his divine attributes. That is not remaining the same yesterday, today, and forever. Both Trinitarians and Oneness must believe that Malachi 3.6 and Hebrews 13.8 is addressing the fact that God, as to his divine attributes and divine characteristics, will always remain the same unchanged past, present, and future. For our Heavenly Father never had to vacate heaven while he simultaneously manifested himself in the flesh to partake of flesh and blood. One does adherents understand that Yahweh God the Father remained unchangeable in the heavens while his own holy arm was revealed as a man down on the earth. Most knowledgeable Trinitarian scholars believe that an alleged God the Son retained all of his divine attributes and characteristics while he simultaneously became the man Christ Jesus through the Incarnation. In like manner, oneness theology believes that God the Father retained all of his divine attributes and characteristics while he simultaneously became the man Christ Jesus through the Incarnation. When we compare both models together, we find that the oneness model brings harmony to all the scriptural data while the Trinitarian doctrine does not. For more videos like this one, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us on the web at apostolicchristianfaith.com. Lord bless.